So my talk today is titled Imagining Sex Between White Men slash fan fiction and the racial politics of feminist fantasy. I'm going to start by talking about fantasy and explaining why I find fan fiction a particularly useful site in which to study it. Fan fiction describes unauthorized stories that people write and share about the media that they love. Films, books, television shows, popular music, sports, etc. What makes fan fiction a particularly interesting site for the questions about gender, sexuality, race, equity, and justice that interest me is that it's driven so intensely by desire and pleasure. People write from the gut, from what Freud called the id. Uh, people pursue what they want to imagine. There's no question of profit or gatekeeping as the primary motivation. So fan fiction is a place for fantasy, which includes, but is not restricted to sexual fantasy. Anything you can dream of, you can write into existence, or you can search and discover that other people got there first. And fantasy is a generative and often disturbing space to approach when we're thinking about inequality and social power. It shows us how social systems live under our skin. Joanna Russ, in a 1984 essay I'll be returning to several times, notes that sexual fantasy materials are like icebergs. The one tenth that shows above the surface is no reliable indicator of the size and significance of the whole thing. Fantasies, sexual and otherwise, cannot be read as realist representations. But that doesn't mean they don't have effects in the real world. Sexual fantasies, for most of the people most of the time, are a way to seek pleasure. But, as Jennifer Nash notes in her 2014 book about Black women's performance of pleasure amid racist representation, The Black Body in Ecstasy, pleasure is part of the machinery of race and gender oppression. Hierarchy often wears the guise of pleasure, even as pleasure can also and simultaneously be a pathway to resistance and liberation. Fantasies, then, are sometimes liberatory, often problematic, and frequently both at the same time. Questions about justice, consent, hierarchy, and harm are asked and answered in a range of radically different ways in the public and private media spaces where fantasies are expressed. Some of these, such as mainstream pornography, are widely seen as bastions of patriarchal and racist norms. Others, like queer sexual spaces, profess liberation. But lines between fantasy, reality, representation, and justice are not easy to draw. The work of fantasy can be, and often is, to imagine more just worlds, ways of living and organizing otherwise in the oppressive norm. But what brings us the most pleasure to imagine is not always what we advocate for politically. And what brings one person pleasure can cause another person harm. All of which leads me to the question I'm concerned with in my work, and which fan fiction opens up pathways to explore. How do we reckon with fantasies structured by an unjust world? That question shapes a book that I'm working on in collaboration with Christina Busset, from which this talk draws. Titled Slash Male Male Fan Fiction and the Politics of Fantasy. Slash, in its most basic definition, is or was fan fiction that imagined erotic and sexual relationships between same sex characters. It's a term that shows up often in fandom and fan studies but it's becoming obsolete. In contemporary Anglophone fan communities, it's more common to call any fanish investment in sex or romance shipping. In the book, we lean into this obsolescence and take up slash in the past tense, making an effort to historicize it as term and genre. We situate slash as a genre whose narratives and tropes we can track across places and times to showcase the development of a sexual and erotic imaginary tied to particular forms of gendered and racialized subjectivity. Slash fan fiction as we understand it emerged in the 1970s and 1980s as a genre of informally published romantic and erotic fiction about sexual relationships between male fictional characters from popular American and British television shows. We look back at its shifting context and its relationship to US media landscapes from the 70s to the 2010s, while attending to the social, cultural, and political interventions that fan fiction writers have used the genre's affordances to make. We understand fan fiction in general, and Slash in particular, to be driven by the force of shared fantasy, 
writing the stories you need or want, or that turn you on. And we examine the power structures that manifest themselves in and through slash fan fiction and provide the conditions of possibility for its creation. The slash genealogy we track is mostly but not entirely based on American and British live action science fiction film and television. We work with this tradition both because it's the one in which we have ourselves been steeped as fans, following Russ's edict that the best person to write about a fantasy is the person for whom it works, and because this genealogy has been a profoundly influential one. It has shaped the public and academic image of fan fiction writing, as well as the institutions that have been built to support it, like the archive of our own. All the genealogies are adjacent or overlapping, including fem slash fandom, the boys love tradition of anime and manga and more. And these have often been eclipsed by scholarly focus on Western media MM fandom. In contrast to this illusion, we aim to delimit the MM fake written within what has sometimes derogatorily been called migratory slash fandom, because we find value in analyzing this as a genre in itself, particularly because of what that genre can tell us about the cultural and political work of sexual and other forms of fantasy. Seeking both to understand why MM has held the dominance it has, as well as to track some of its influences and effects, we explore Slash's work, its context, and its implications. The politics of fantasy, as they unfold throughout our book, are defined by conflict and ambiguity, filled with conflicting desires among and within Slash writers and texts. We attend closely to the ways in which fan fiction's fulfillment of narrative desire can result in complicity with many kinds of power, even as it is also used to imaginatively fulfill radical desires for justice and liberation. Scholars and participants have claimed Slash as a feminist practice since its early days, largely due to its circulation within communities composed primarily of women. Arguing that Slash fandom has indeed created a feminist sexual imaginary, but one that is far from wholly liberatory, Musa and I develop a periodization of Slash's gender politics, building upon a 2018 article where we framed Slash's history through a series of waves in an, an allusionality to the common delineation for US feminist movements. This periodization cannot account fully for complexity and overlap, but nevertheless, it can help us understand how the politics of fantasy change over time. So our first moment, or wave, which we call early Slash, is dominant in the era of zines on the early web, from the first slash fic in the late 60s through to the 1990s, centered on fan writers as women who use male protagonists and male bodies to envisage ideal romantic relationships and fantasize about sexual experimentation. Operating in conversation with the best known strands of what gets called second wave feminism, these fan contend with the limitations on sexual expression experienced by mostly white, mostly cisgender women in, het in heteropatriarchy. Its fantasy landscape is defined by an erotics of masculine injury. Our second wave, which we call peak slash, and which is dominant from the 90s through to the late 2000s, grew more invested in realism and began to develop a politically self-aware movement that confronted fantasized men with the realities of same-sex male relationships in the bounds of the fan community's shared understanding. Corresponding with the rise of the internet yet before the explosion of social media, Fans at this moment created their own sets of norms that combined influence from queer and BDSM-centric sexual politics with an investment in fantasies of trauma and vulnerability, again played out on white male bodies. Our third wave, which we call post-slash, as it continues into the present where the terminology of slash has been replaced by the non-gender specific shipping, is dominant in the age of social media, from the early 2010s to the present. These works are more likely to reckon with the complex diversity of genders and sexualities, and to enter into conversation with social justice movements outside of fandom on and offline, ranging from hashtag-based calls for representation to in-depth intersectional and abolitionist critique. In this post-slash moment, the hegemony of white male bodies in, in slash slash sippings imaginary has also been broken by the immense transnational popularity of East Asian media, something I'm not gonna talk about today, but that I think the framework to develop in this talk can help us understand. These stages are broadly chronological, yet it's important to know that they are also synchronic in the mode of Raymond Williams', of Raymond Williams residual, dominant and emergent cultural forms. 
After all, cultural narratives that seem to have become old fashioned and outmoded do not disappear as soon as academics have declared them so. And traces of every new idea can be found in the old. Formations ripple into and through one another in relationships of conflict and coexistence that cannot be reductively marshaled into a singular progress narrative. But there is a lot that this categorical framework makes it easier to see. In Slash Fang's discussions of their own reading and writing, gender is a constant topic of conversation and race is rarely so. Yet, as this collage of some of the most popular pairings over the years demonstrates, there is a notable trend. Anyone who has experienced a fanish investment in one of these pairings will likely experience a mixed affect on looking at this collage. Recognition of the undeniable correlation alongside a warm surge of appreciation for what made your particular favorite two white men special and unique. That uniqueness would have been created most likely less by the men themselves, the actors who played them, or the industrially produced narratives in which they starred, and more by the collective creativity that surged in the communities that iterated endless stories around them. That contradictory problematic pleasure is what I try to unpack. Given that white supremacy and racial capitalism are the infrastructures on top of which fan communities, archives, and fictions are constructed, it's imperative to consider how fanish racial imaginaries operate in terms of what Sharon Holland called racism's erotic life. The intimate effects of pervasive racializing logics on bodies and psyches that produce pleasure, pain, and everything in between. In his 2019 book, Racial Worldmaking, Mark Jerang asks us to notice when and how race becomes salient, which means when and how we notice it and how genre conventions structure racial worlding. Slash's genre form has not typically made race salient, though it's always present, it only gets noticed when explicit or implicit racism calls for critique. In this talk, I insist that to understand the work of fantasy in which Slash engages, race must become salient. We must ask how it is that white male bodies and sexual congress became a site of feminist fantasy, as well as thinking about how their signification has changed over time. In 1998, Green, Jenkins and Jenkins published a roundtable in which Slash fans discussed the normal female interest in men bonking, a phrase that comes from fan M.P. Glasgow, who used it to describe Slash in a zine in 1993. In 2021, Mel Stanfield argued that a more accurate definition would be straight white women writing about men bonking, arguing for more attention to be paid to whiteness in fans of fandom. As Stanfield, along with Rebecca Wanzo, Rukmini Pandey, Benjamin Wu, and several others have demonstrated, the foundation for fan studies has rested upon an unarticulated whiteness, even as its politics has tended to the progressive. In Pandey's words, fan repurposing is frequently subversive in one context, while coercive in another. Fandom's complicity with corporate interests and the heteronormative tendencies of many storylines in the supposedly queer space are some of the ways this dynamic has been engaged in my work and that of others. Slash has been theorized, including by me, as a space for queer world making in which the bodies of fictional and fictionalized men provide an opportunity for shared erotics and creativity. Updating Glasgow's language for a trans-affirming queer studies lens, Eco Willis uses the shorthand framework women imagining sex between men to argue that slash crosses or transes existing sexualities and genders, as fans use its techniques to create different gendered meanings and self-understandings. Acknowledging that any gender analysis is insufficient if it cannot account for race, we must shift this to describe Slash's foundation as the imagination of sex between white men. Lest it seem that my gathering of white male parents is a product of white male protagonist dominance in media from the 60s to the, to the 2000s, at least in the science fiction shows that tended to spawn big fandoms, I want to offer a brief example coming from the end of the period of, of the periodization moment from so-called post-slash. As we approach the present, popular American media grew more diverse, even within the corporate hegemony of science fiction, film, and television. Take Star Wars. The 2015 film that kicked off the franchise's latest iteration, The Force Awakens, featured two central characters whose dynamic invoked many of Slash fans' most loved tropes, played by a Black and a Latino actor. The relationship between reformed stormtrooper Finn, John Boyega, and hotshot rebel pilot Poe, Oscar Isaac, 
shorthanded to Storm Pilot, was even widely read through the lens of Slash by popular media. The centrality of characters of color to the latest Star Wars highlights changes in dominant media in recent years, with diversity being seen ever more as a selling point. In the case of Star Wars, high profile white male fans' public racism showed the limitations of that progress narrative, while also providing a negative example from which many progressive minded fan fiction writers sought to differentiate themselves. The anticipated popularity of Storm Pilot Slash might have seemed that it would solidify fandom's progressive self image and put the lie to claims that it fetishizes white masculinity. But Storm Pilot was not, in fact, all that popular. An initial surge of fake was not maintained over time, especially in the spaces where Slash fandom's long term subcultures dwelled. Instead, the popularity about a fic about the white male leaders of the Empire, Kylo Ren, played by Adam Driver, and minor character Hux, Donald Gleason, surged. This trend is not only seen in the context of Star Wars. As JSA Lowe and others have written, black and brown characters and slash pairings are invariably much less popular than their all-white cognates. Why? In a widely read essay that Pandey discusses at length in her 2018 book Squee from the Margins, Fan writer Francesca claimed that a wave of call-outs of the ways Finn and Poe have been represented had led writers to step back from the pairing and return to the comforting arms of the white stormtroopers. Pandy rightly critiques Francesca for casting anti-racist fans as killjoys, whose critical demands are responsible for making their pairing less popular. But her analysis does hold significant explanatory force. It seems wholly likely the fans steeped in slash subculture's whiteness were unprepared to deal with the different cultural meanings carried by the fantasy sexualization of a black man that would be held by the same story written onto a white body. Sexualized white and black male bodies hold very different roles in a cultural imaginary that still lives in the wake of chattel slavery and its proliferating afterlives. As Poe Johnson writes in the 2018 analysis of fandom and fan studies' failure to account for racial politics, for those who both create and consume content, there exists the capacity to occupy the black body, to imbue it and embody it with deeply rooted historic aggressions that reify the systematic and institutional oppressions found in the DNA of the United States. In order to avoid this reification, creators must make a deliberate and concerted effort to use anti-racist and decolonial methodologies. Simply wanting to be inclusive is not enough. It has never been enough. The idea that Slash's racial imaginary could be radically changed simply by swapping out the bodies at its center participates in a powerful liberal fantasy. The idea that a shift in representation alone, the inaction of what appears to be inclusion without anti-racist and decolonial methodologies, can challenge the racist structures at the heart of everyday life in the US and elsewhere. Representation certainly matters, and the immense importance that Finn and the other central characters of color in the new Star Wars have had to racialized fans makes that clear. But it's also a site in which the erotic life of racism makes itself powerfully felt. Kristen Warner coins the term plastic representation to call attention to the ways that highly visible bodies of color in popular media can nevertheless serve to perpetuate structures of white supremacy. She writes that plastic representation uses the wonder that comes from seeing characters on screen who serve as visual identifier for specific demographics in order to flatten the expectation to desire anything more. Many of the starring roles for actors of color in Star Wars can be seen in plastic as plastic representation. The diversity they offer is visual only without a sense of race as a social category operating in the real world. White supremacist fanboys set off their hate campaigns, claiming ownership of the franchise alongside their allegiance to the whiteness of the original protagonists. But even among progressive fan fiction writers who decry their intent, racialized tropes and damaging stereotypes alternate with the siren call of sexualized white male bodies. Changes of dominant representation may do less to demonstrate the anti-racist power of transformative works than they do to make visible the inherent racialization of Slash's founding fantasies, the power that imagining sex between white men continues to exert. It's to these founding fantasies that I now turn. <laughs>
The idea that Slash is a feminist form of sexual fantasy dominates early Slash's contributions to fan studies. It was most fully expressed by Joanna Russ, whose 1984 article, Pornography by Women for Women with Love, used the then underground genre of homoerotic explicit Star Trek fic as a salvo in the feminist sex wars. The sex wars, which dominated feminist discourse in the 80s and in the 80s in the United States, revolved around concerns about the contributions of porn and BDSM to physical and discursive violence against women. Opposing camps laid claim to anti-porn and pro-sex positions, which can loosely be defined as asserting, on the one hand, that pornographic representation and sexual role play cause harm by reinforcing dominant power structures, and on the other, that sexual imagery and performance is a rich and diverse interior and interpersonal landscape whose relationship to real world hierarchy and violence cannot be determined in advance. Russ argues that Slash opens up a pathway between the two sides in this binary because the creation of pornography by women without representations of women is such a liberating prospect. In the words of Patricia Fazer Lam and Diana Vith, who were co participants with Russ in the early 80s Slash fandom, K at KS is Kirk Spock, the original slash. Um, these stories remove gender as a governing and determining focus in the love relationship. Lovers may have many problems to confront, but one never arises. One part is inferior rank in a sexist society. And as commented, the what if behind Kirk slash Spock, Star Trek, is what if I were free? These novel stories and poems provide a new way of loving and a vision of new possibilities for women. Russ argued that the content of Kirk Spock fit, in which characters spend many hours caring for one another's lovingly described wounds and softly circling around the possibility of romantic connection before emerging into explicit and detailed sex, sexualizes the feminine condition of compulsory care labor, lack of autonomy, and endless deferment of desire. Slash writers have, she says, made out of the restriction of the patriarchy their own sexual cues. And, and this opens up new and vital ways to understand the relationship between sex, fantasy, and power. I find Russ's analysis profound, profoundly generative. Her exploration of the erotics of patriarchy underlies a lot of the theorization Bussa and I develop in our book. Nevertheless, she also participates in a tendency shared by a great deal of sex wars discourse and other feminist theory, when she asserts confidently that women and patriarchy are characters categories that can be discussed unmodified. As Lorna Bracewell writes in her important 2021 book, How We Lost the Sex Wars, a monistic focus on the sexual needs, experiences, and desires of white women limited the radical potential of both anti-porn and pro-sex feminist positions, especially as they were constructed in opposition to one another. Bracewell shows how women of color feminist thought developed more complex currents within both anti-porn and pro-sex feminism that incorporated analysis of how race structures the relationship between gender, sexuality, and power. Within the foundational analyses of slash as feminist sex, race was always part of the conversation, but in ways that reinforced the singular focus on gender. Slash fandom's relationship to race and representation was shaped by its close association with US science fiction television. In science fiction, as Isaiah Lavender writes, one often talks about race by not talking about race. Race is instead whether metaphorical or abstract through tropes such as alien species or far future civilizations. Celebrating an imagined future for the 60s version of liberal diversity, the multiracial cast of the original Star Trek series famously allowed for television's first interracial kiss in 1968, one year after the US Supreme Court struck down interracial marriage bans in Loving West Virginia. Michelle Nichols' role as Lieutenant Uhura became an icon for Afrofuturism and liberal visions of racial progress alike. Yet the visible presence of a Black woman on the bridge was never made an explicit part of the show's plot or world building. Instead, its power existed outside the narrative in an, area, in an era where televisual representation of a Black future carried greater weight than it does in the era of plastic representation. Abigail DeKosnick, Adrian Marie Brown, and Andre Carrington are among those who have written about Star Trek's importance in their Black and immigrant family narratives. Yet even as racial progress signified by Star Trek's casting was meaningful to audiences of color, 
the racial world making in which Star Trek participated allowed both the show and its white fans to claim a degree of progressiveness without unsettling their status quo. Star Trek fans took infinite diversity and infinite combination as their motto. Yet organized fan activity in zines and conventions, at least insofar as it has made its way into fan studies histories, did not reflect the true racial diversity of folks who were invested in the show. Instead, early Slash and the scholarship that was written about it made Star Trek's sublimation of race onto the figure of the alien one of its key features through the character of Spock. Um, Spock's alien species stood in for racial and ethnic alterity. His cultural and physical difference from his captain and friend Kirk repeatedly emphasized in both series and fan fiction. So I, I trailed this talk on my um, social media by saying, come find out about Spock's penis in relationship to the sex war. So here it is. <laughs> in Joanna Russ's words, instead of presenting us with a couple who are of different sexes, but the same species, Kirk Spock creates a couple who are of different species, but the same sex. Spock, for those not fully versed in Star Trek lore, is half human and half Vulcan. His alien side signaled by the famous pointed ears as well as the less visible green hue of his blood, which led to vibrant speculation in fan fiction about what his alien penis might look like. Spock was played by the Jewish Leonard Nimoy as an intellectual rational foil to Kirk's red-blooded, white-bred future American. In Star Trek itself, Spock's racial difference seems to map at some times onto Jewish stereotype and others onto Asian, with Kirk proclaiming Spock to be Chinese in one episode that sees the characters transported to 1930s New York. In writings by early Slash fans, as well as other cultural critics, however, the relationship between Kirk and Spock becomes one of American settler colonial archetype. Lam and Vies' influential essay takes as its epigraph Leslie Fiedler's 1960 vision from Love and Death in the American Novel of a homosocial coupling that haunts the American psyche. Two lonely men, one dark-skinned, one white, band together over a carefully guarded fire in the virgin heart of the American wilderness. They have forsaken all others for the sake of the austere, almost inarticulate, but unquestioned love which binds them to each other and to the world of nature, which they have preferred to civilization. Lama V's emphasis on slash a storytelling about love between equals is constantly cited by scholars thinking through the gender politics of slash. The fact that they make this connection through a racial analogy is rarely brought up by subsequent scholars. Yet, drawing upon Fiedler at length, they describe Spock's racial coding as alternately black, indigenous, and mixed race, noting that he will never pass in a federation dominated by human, analogically white, males. The fantasy at play here is based both on equality and on its opposite. Kirk and Spock are asserted to be perfectly balanced, but also Spock is the the dark-skinned partner, the one whose species alterity structures the shape of the relationship. In Fiedler's model, as Lam and Vith do not point out, the unquestioned law is a fiction constructed from the white participant's perspective. The black or native racialized other imagined as redemption for the acts of violence white America has committed. The white author, Fiedler writes in a 1948 article, dreams of his acceptance at the breast he has most utterly offended, and receives it through a fantasy of interracial companionship that the, reality, the realities of history and politics render very far from the real. There is, I would suggest, a frisson of such redemption also in white slash authors writing of Spock as a sympathetic and misunderstood equal whose bodily alterity can be freely and deliciously fetishized. Slash's erotic fantasies are founded on a presence but erasure of race in which the colorblind stereotype I don't care if you're black, white, or green, becomes literal. Slash fandom has pursued fictional world building over real world resonances, writing difference onto white male bodies through myriad fics about Spock's alien physiology and culture as a Vulcan among humans. The racial fantasy of the unknowable other, the mysterious green penis that could operate any number of ways, allows for Slash's writers to imagine racial others without placing themselves at the risk of participating in racism by directly depicting human races. The exemplary work of fan fiction that Russ describes herself as writing at the end of her critical essay is a case in point. 
demonstrating the centrality to her fantasies of domination alongside egalitarian romance in the origins of Slash. She writes that she's putting down her pen to continue a fic in which Spock is preparing to beat Kirk, whom he has bought as a slave in an alternate universe in which violent Vulcan, Spock's planet, never reformed. It requires a lot of elision, whether purposeful or unconscious, for an American writer to fictionalize enslavement without reference to the recent history and long shadow of chattel slavery and its afterlife. Spock's alien alterity provides an alibi for the exploration of desires surely seeded in a violent history and incomplete reform that is much closer to home. We know from Slash's romance tropes that Spock's preparation to beat Kirk will likely be followed by the emergence of a tender and caring relationship that will allow the couple to transcend the inequalities between them, as Fiedler's interracial couple claim to do. Yet as with Fiedler's couple, that transcendence can be imagined only through a practice of racial world-making that maintains whiteness at its centre. If the invisibilization of race through the unmarked universality of whiteness has characterized the imaginary of slash fandom as well as the scholarly field of fan studies, how and in what ways has race become visible? In a 2021 article, Mel Stanfill and I introduced the term fan of color critique to name the long-standing, vital, theoretical and activist work being done in fan communities by those who share the commitments and coalitions of women of color, feminist thought and queer of color critique. If early Slash's politics of fantasy engage with race as analogy or sublimation, Fan of Color Critique has called attention to these dynamics and to the consequences of whiteness's unmarked centrality to the landscape of shared sexual fantasies. In the histories of race and speculative media fandom, 2009's eruption of race fail often gets cited as a starting point, but that was one flashpoint in an ongoing discussion that started far earlier. To offer one brief example of a fan of color critique named the racial politics of Slash and sought to operationalize fandom's feminist aspirations in an intersectional way, I'd like to take us to the mid 2000s and the forgettable sci fi channel show Stargate Atlantis, which at least one person in this room remembers, um, based on the chat. It ran from 2004 to 2009 and had a large and generative fandom that fit into our periodization of peak Slash. Among many other problematic tendencies, and I'm going to Oh, there it is, okay. Among many other problematic tendencies, the show mapped the colonizing discourse of US militarism onto an othered galaxy populated by backwards humans properly grateful for rescue from life-sucking aliens. In a combination of TV stereotyping and sci-fi cliche, the show killed off all of its Earth characters of color and carefully marked the alienness of the natives who just happened to be the only characters played by actors of color. In this promotional image, we see Jason Momoa's racial Ronan and Rachel Luttrell's Taylor, marked clearly by their position and dress as different, rough, or exotically sexy in comparison to the white actors. The casting exemplified how the bodies of colour that appear on genre fiction screens often show up without contextual awareness, either due to science fiction troping or the industrial reproduction of colour blindness. So they were both aliens, they were ostensibly outside the US military structure of the show's central premise and the American racial histories of its reception, um, while they were also placed in stereotypical and subordinate positions in the narrative. The show's slash fandom centered around John and Rodney, pr predictably the two main white guys, and was characterized by playful fan works and an impressive range of alternate universe envisioning of characters and narratives. Race became the focus of the fanish conversation in the context of alternate universe fix, where characters are placed into different contexts, often the modern day US, sometimes other speculative tropes or other genres. Found of crit color critics pointed out that Taylor and Ronan would often appear in subordinate roles in these AUs, as a nurse to the main pairing's doctors, as baristas when the main characters bought coffee, and in one memorable example, as the main character's cats. While well, the discussion on LiveJournal a precursor to today's social media callouts was filled with defensive responses. A key thread that emerged was a demand that fan communities live up to a higher standard than the media to which they respond. One commenter, defending fic from the charge of racism, wrote, fan fiction is the least fucked up racist sexist thing in this patriarchy. And fanfic is certainly less racist than the show itself, which I'm sure you're still watching. For this commenter, Fanish creativity was always already outside the patriarchal and racist paradigms of mainstream TV, even as watching mainstream TV automatically embeds you in those paradigms. 
Another addressed concern that fan fiction by its nature shared the failures of fan of canon or source text. Writing that to excuse the perpetuation of racism on the grounds that it's not one's job to fix canon is disingenuous and frankly offensive. For this commenter, to transform dominant politics was not only possible but ethically imperative for fan writers. A third contributor gave a pithy summation. You simply do not get to be proud of your bad liberal pro-gay political self, your porn positive feminist self, using big buzzwords like subtext and subverting the dominant paradigm. Then turn around and look puzzled and scratch your head. People ask why other dominant paradigms in the media are carried over into fandom. In the wake of these and other re related explosive discussions, critiques of the dominant paradigm began to appear much more frequently in fandom's newsletters and feeds. Fiction and image festivals to celebrate characters of colour multiplied, more voices were added to those critiquing fans' problematic utopianisms, and fans demanded that fanish meta discourse live up to its self image by making something more of its source than the source made of itself. An optimistic logic ran through this analysis of slash fandom of anti racism, as I and others discussed in the late 2000 moments when it was happening. If slash fan fiction, if slash fan fiction can transform, the heteronormative paradigms of dominant media, the logic goes. Its writers ought to be well-placed to recognize and challenge paradigms of racial exclusion and white supremacy as well, with the fans of color who daily suffer the blows of racial oppression leading the way. This argument led many slash writers and readers to question their own unchallenged assumptions. Yet it struggled to account for the centrality of fantasy and pleasure, including the pleasure of racialized fans who found themselves cast as educators performing their own exclusion in order to teach white fans how not to perpetuate it. Munoz writes in this identifications of the burden of liveness that gets imposed on minority subjects who are expected to perform for the amusement of a dominant power block. For fans who find themselves in racial, sexual, gender, or ability minorities, that burden of liveness becomes a burden of critique, where majority fans on the road to enlightenment can feel entitled to be led by the hand through their mistakes. The level of burnout for fan of color critics has been and continues to be high. And one reason for that may be that the racial components of slash fandom's pleasures cannot be educated away or replaced with the positive images vision of representation. Juxtaposing the pleasures of racial sublimation in early slash with peak slash's emerging fan of color critique makes space for naming and challenging the whiteness of slash but may also obscure the complex contradictory dimensions of the politics of fantasy. In a personal reflection on her own fandom, published in 2019, Emily Raimundo reflects on the decades of gender analysis of Slash from a queer women of color feminist perspective. Queer women of color are, she notes, taught to love white men in a way we are never taught to love ourselves. It's a dangerous love. As she describes her fandom of the TV show Supernatural and its Slash, Imagining yourself in stories that aren't about you, projecting yourself into white male bodies and the narratives that unfold around those bodies, these are survival tactics for minorities. But everyone knows the one about the girl who lingers too long in the underworld and strays too far from her own body to find it again. This passage recalls a moment Munoz uses to lay the foundation of a queer of color critique in disidentifications, where he describes racial exclusion in spaces dedicated to queer liberatory pleasures. In the black queer filmmaker and poet Marlon Riggs' 1988 film, Tongues Untied, he describes the utopian gay space of San Francisco's Castro as a world immersed in vanilla. Riggs savors a flavor, deliberately not his own, but finds little nourishment in it. For Riggs, this flavor of vanilla is a waypoint on a path to the darker, richer pleasures of love between black men. Munoz likewise celebrates queer of color connections, but his framework emphasizes what queers of color may gain in and through spaces that are not their own, even as those spaces can also be violent and painful. Minoritized subjects, like majoritarian ones, feel complicated desires for the fucked up, even racist shit that hails them. Thinking through the racial politics and projects of Slash must include extended lingering in the underworld that Raimundo references, with close attention to what kind of feminist sex Slash's queer readers and writers of color are creating. If Slash is iconically women writing about white men having sex, what happens when the writers and readers are not white? Fan of color critique as a framework places fans of color in the position of analyst and theorist, 
calling attention to the ways in which white fans play to reproduce racial violence. But as fan of color critics have made a key insight, the positioning of people of color as exclusively and necessarily arbiters of racism is itself a racist act, especially within a community that revolves around the sharing of pleasure and the joyous embrace of the id. White feminist theories of slash have made much of the positioning of women as authors of the bodily act of men, empowered by being placed behind the camera, holding the pen or at the computer, rather than in the traditionally feminine position of being available to be looked at. Can the racial dimensions of slash be illuminated by this kind of analysis also? If we think of the hegemonically inviolable white male body, narratively manipulated and transformed to fulfill the sexual fantasies of women of color? I have no demographic information to suggest numbers of writers and readers of color in slash fandom, but they have certainly always been there. Because slash fandom took place predominantly in text-based spaces where identification was pseudonymous and a matter of trust, and because it has also always been a racist place, their identities have rarely been public. For the last example in this talk though, I want to talk very briefly about one such story from late in the era of peak slash by an author identifying herself as a black woman, a black woman whose reading and writing community at the time of the story's writing included many who were vocal in creating and maintaining fan of color critique. The story clarifies the racial affordances of slash fan fiction's erotics, not because of a tokenistic emphasis on the identity of the author, but because of the work in which the writing itself engages. Poison Taster published the first installment of her epic slash fic, A Kept Boy, in July 2008. It completed it 200,000 words later, in September 2011. It's a story about fictionalized versions of real world individuals, in this case, actors who played characters in Supernatural, and it engages in speculative world building to imagine these characters into a setting different from the realist world, an AU. The primary pairing was between Jensen Ackles, who played Dean Winchester on Supernatural, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who played his father. The story proved very popular, and Poison Taster not only wrote numerous additional works set in its universe, but welcomed other writers to participate. 37, sorry, 37 works are listed as inspired by a kept boy at the fan fiction repository Archive of Our Own. A kept boy and its universe are set in an alternate United States in which a debt-based vision of slavery is legal and compulsory. The characters it depicts, almost exclusively white, predominantly men, own and are owned. And the primary romance is between a Jensen who has been enslaved since early childhood and a slave owner with abolitionist aspirations, Jeff, who buys Jensen at the beginning of the story. In its summary, the story is described as involving slavery and abuse, inequalities of power, and dark adult concepts regarding sin. It's a love story, but it goes through some bad, dark places to get there. Those bad, dark places involve characters subjected to eroticized violence and domination that simultaneously produce pleasure and violence, trauma and release. It's a BDSM romance fantasy of power and force that becomes power exchange that becomes love, while also struggling with complicity and consent. And it offers pleasures that would play out very differently were they not manifesting on white male fictionalized bodies. When I mentioned the popular slash trope of the slavery AU in my reference to Joanna Russ's writing above, I said that to romanticize a master-slave relationship as a form of eroticized equality relies on the refusal of the racialized reality of real histories of domination. Writing such stories with attention to race would demand slash writers reckon with the histories of fetish and desire that Poe alludes to and through which Nash and others have worked. Poison Taster's fake resists ca characterization in these terms. Angie Fazekas has argued that the trope of the slave EU is irredeemable. Even when claiming or believing itself to be doing complex and challenging things with the narratives of power and desire, in the hands of white writers writing about white bodies, it reproduces anti-blackness by presuming the histories of violence and dehumanization are available to be the backdrop of white sexual imagining. Fazekas' argument which builds on the fan of color critiques I mentioned above, accurately accounts for the inattentive racial world-making practice in much fic. But it does not allow for the possibility that the white male bodies in the fiction may be imagined, produced, and consumed by anyone other than white women. Different tools for understanding works like uh, I Kept Boy have been developed in the world of racialized erotics within black feminist thought and queer of color critique. Nash's Black Body and Ecstasy builds a theoretical framework for racial pleasures, 
complicated contradictory formations of pleasure and violence in which structural oppression and affective liberation sit side by side. Ariane Cruz writes in The Color of Kink about race play, BDSM practice in which the history of enslavement and anti-blackness are engaged by consensual practitioners. She works through the complex pleasures black women find in eroticizing the racism to which they are subjected every day. Juana Maria Rodriguez takes up similar questions in exploring queer Latina femme enjoyment of porn in which Latina women are subjected to violence. The work of fantasy, Rodriguez states, is a way to inhabit the imagined elsewhere of a radical sexual sociality, even when that elsewhere necessitates passage through barbed, viscous confrontations, brimming with social and psychic abjection pain. All these theories are written about women of color as enactors of sexual performance, consumers and producers of images, even if it's in porn designed for a male gaze. Their applicability to the erotics of white masculinity is not clear. In Poison Taster Story, though, a radical sexual sociality, barbed and viscous as Rodriguez envisages, though also softened by Slash's genre of emphasis on love, is imagined through bodies and psyches of white male figures. The fic is both an erotic outlet and a mediation on how violence and power reproduce themselves economically and psychologically in individuals and communities. The world building of a slaveholding society is clearly differentiated from chattel slavery, with enslavement being tied to debt. It explores racialization and the absence of visual racial signifiers. One function served by the whiteness of the main characters here is to allow for these erotics to be explored without directly invoking the trauma that realist representation of enslavement, even an explicitly fantasy version, would necessitate. The story offers some responses to the question with which I began. What do we do with sexual fantasy structured by an unjust world? In the quotation I offer here, the owner of protagonist, Jeff, has been lament lamenting how difficult it is to deal with the enslaved co-protagonist he had just purchased, Jensen, because Jensen has internalized the oppressive system in which they live into his erotic and personal life. While Jeff is working to overthrow that system and horrified to think he may have to participate. The answer is not based in critique or in activism against an unspeakably unjust system, but on the inescapable problematics, the inescapable problematic realities of living with the damage such a system causes. Jensen, Jeff's friend tells him, is wired this way. And he's a bloody goddamn person, which means he can't just be unwired. You can, we can, only deal with him as he is. Desire and fantasy don't run in line with politics as we've seen, which does not mean the politics they create and the harm they cause cannot be critiqued. But even while working towards social and political transformations that would alter the conditions under which desire and fantasy develops, you have to deal with them as they are. To close then, in the 2019 essay on Slash that I cited above, Raimondo asks, what is it exactly about watching white men love each other that's proved so powerful and so pleasurable? I've offered some answers to that question here. Perhaps it is turning the powerful and dangerous vulnerable, even feminized. Perhaps it's the side effect of the dominant figuration of white masculinity as the only way to be fully human. The astonishing manipulability of an imaginary unmarked body in which the anxieties of representation can be set aside. The contradictions between allowing one's sexual fantasies to play out fully and confronting the politics on which they touch are immense and Slash has worked through them exhaustively. Depictions of white masculinity have provided both a smokescreen to avoid recognition of the racial dynamics of feminine sexual fantasy and a canvas on which to explore those dynamics. With Slash receding into a residual formation and white men becoming perhaps finally less dominant in American professional media and across fan fiction transnational circuits, this fantasy structure is likely already on the way out, but its traces are likely to remain. No easy arguments can claim these fantasies for liberation from racism and white supremacy. But nor is their complicity a necessary or simple thing. It may well be that Slash's pleasures, the speculative erotics of white masculinity, hinder more than help the dismantling of white supremacy that must be part of any feminist movement worth the name. But we can learn something from them before we kiss them goodbye. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, thank you. That was so fascinating. And there are so many TV shows and fandoms that I've participated over the years. <laughs> I got really excited. Um, and since I already am speaking, maybe I can use this opportunity to ask my first question, uh, which actually refers to something that she said uh, when you were describing the, the the free kind of interlocking waves of, of slash fiction. And I was thinking about the term you, you used, um, the erotics of masculine injury. I, I kind of, you know, it was something that really kind of struck a chord with me. And I, I've been thinking about this, this, especially in the light of the example you, you've just given us, the, the a kept boy, which is, again, you know, this is, this, we are still talking about the erotics of masculine injury. I was kind of wondering if you can perhaps um, explore this a little bit more for us and, and maybe talk about how this might be, uh, I don't know if recuperated is the is the right is, is the right word here, but um, you know what's the what's the kind of politics of eroticizing specifically masculine pain or injury? I'm not thinking about the kind of hurt hurt comfort stories, but in general, just kind of BDSM, transgressive, you know, sex and non com um, kind of scenes and how you know like what's going on here? Like what's happening to masculinity? And if there is something useful for the for the readers here. I mean, apart from the, the, you know, the kind of pleasures that they're receiving. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, it, you know, when um, my co-writer and I shared some of these this, these frameworks with a, a, a fandom friend who's not an academic, she said, actually, erotics is masculine injury. You mean hurt comfort? And we said, yes, that, that's what we mean, uh, among other things, right? Um, I think... You know, so the, the, the larger book project has a lot to say about multiple different iterations of this. I think it is closely tied to racialization also. Um, but Slash as a genre, fan fiction, it is just full of narratives about injury and trauma, right? Physical, mental, any number of different ways. And it's been theorized since the beginning of people studying Slash fandom. So actually Camille Bacon-Smith, her 1992 book Enterprising Women has a very long chapter about hurt comfort and she says this is the this is the heart of what fandom was all about and fans were kind of critical of that chapter actually but I think in some ways they were maybe a little critical of it because it hit quite close to home um you know because I I think she she gets very psychological about it in ways that I would hesitate to do but wonder whether there may be some valid validity to that analysis um I think I mean, hurt comfort, Joanna Russ talks about it as, you know, this is what women sexual, sex, socialize within patriarchy or sexualizing because the idea of care is so much part of femininity and it's not sexy, but when you make it sexy, you kind of take control. Um, I think making these very powerful, often kind of superhero type characters, um, turning them into instead sort of traumatized individuals who then have to figure out how to respond to that trauma or who then have to um, be part of a caring mutual relationship. I think that's a fantasy that's operative for many different people in many different ways. I think it speaks to um, some of the, like what we all wish we could have within capitalism, but can, right? The kind of fantasy of interrelationship, inter interrelationality. Um, I think it's a, it's a power thing in lots of ways, like a way of thinking about power, power exchange, consent, uh, where the writer gets to have the power over bodies. Um, I think sometimes the hurt is very tied to comfort and it's all about um, a non-realist version of care, right? A non-realist version of um, how intimacy could develop and it gets imagined through pain and injury because, um, in constructions of white masculinity that being profoundly injured is the only way you get to be vulnerable right um, and so there's a pleasure to making that happen um that it also the ways that masculine injury can play out within media and then again within slash um can have actually very toxic dimensions right so there's a critique um things wings made a vid about this um and the, the, there's a critique of like fetishization of the man's 
perfect tear of sadness when his woman has been horribly murdered that it completely ignores the actual woman who actually got murdered you know um so there's just so much to say about it and I was quite pleased with the phrase erotics of masculine injury because I thought that summed it all up quite nicely but there's like 12 books to be written about what that actually means in practice right in the different contexts in which it plays out um one of the things that we argue about slash is that it's sexual fantasy but actually to really understand it a lot of it's not sexual um so like you know there's it's about intimacy it's about power it's about collectivity it's about world building um and a lot of it is both very problematic and kind of aspiring to some version of political liberation that we may or may not agree with you know so I think doing these things to usually white male bodies um is part of that movement toward a transformative work that tries to change the way that gender sexuality operate um while also being very turned on by the realities in which we already do exist and so you're kind of playing that borderline between fetishizing something and transforming it if that makes sense yeah yeah thank you um just a kind of quick comment because I've, I've been um thinking also how it ties in with crisis of masculinity and, and the kind of you know how in mainstream narratives we get to see you know traumatized white men mm -hmm. kind of grow beards and then you know go into the forest or turkey like james bond right and then they kind of you have this glorious comeback and they kind of defeat their trauma and uh, and in slash we don't get to see that i mean it's, it's not an individual work you know to just defeat your trauma and just you know you lose the beard and you suddenly are all right it's something that is always kind of collective and, and based on intimacy as you've said and it's not really something we see often in those kind of big budget um, mainstream right. crisis of masculinity narratives okay thank you thank you so much for your answer we have a question from anna kurovitska uh yeah thank you uh thank you so much for that lecture that was uh really an amazing sort of summary of all these thorny debates, or at least part of these thorny debates in, in fandom. And I have, um, I, I kind of have two questions, I suppose. One refers to the last thing, or one of the last things you said about the, like, potential end of Slash, or where Slash is going. So I was wondering if you could expand on that and say, um, you know, what you see going on there, and, you know, are we to like mourn our slash or are we to uh you know where are we going as fandom or fandoms rather um the second is maybe a sort of a more general question about this um, notion of fantasy that you talk about and also desire that's connected to that and um a lot of your discussion made made me think of this recent book by Amya Srinivasan uh, the right to sex which many of us at the American Studies Center have read and discussed. And um, among other things, she um, talks about um, the politics of desire and she specifically talks about the sort of uh, the, the problem of um, some groups of people being considered undesirable or unlovable even, but specifically undesirable due to, um, again, racist, capitalist, ableist notions of desirability and she talks specifically about uh, non-white men and about sort of how that plays out how on the sexual market so to speak certain groups are just disadvantaged uh, because of these um, like logics of um, th that, that lead to to uh, their um, marginalization and the, the problem of course the central problem with even posing that question is that uh, people get so very defensive of their fantasies and desires, saying that this is not something I can do anything about, this is just who I am or what I desire, it's beyond me, it's not political, it's somehow internal. And this is also something that I feel like in fandom is, is, is there, it's the, you know, some of the quotes you, you gave us about fans of color being frustrated with, uh, the white fans rejecting this political responsibility. But yeah, I was wondering, you know, about your thoughts on the possibility or the likelihood or the, you know, imaginability of like, I don't know, shaping our desires, I suppose, or shaping fantasies in fandom so that they are not quite so racist. Yes. Um, I don't know that book, but um, I think the arguments that you describe it making, I'll read it, but the arguments that you describe it making um, sound to me 
like they have a lot in common with many of the arguments made in specifically in queer of color critique and um and trans of color studies um and also in kind of tr um tr online uh or trans activist discourses where you hear about like i think uh i forgot i forgot the term that was used but um the pink curtain or something but like you're not gonna like the the um the, the considered equality of trans women ends and people's willingness to desire them, right? Like that some of those critiques have been made. Um, I'm just nodding along to what you're saying um, in terms of the politics of desire. I th actually think that that question and your first question are related, right? Because I think slash, I mean, slash will be over and it will also never go away, right? Like, you know, if you know um, the Raymond Williams framework where you have the emerge and the dominant and the residual, like, structures of feeling, structures of um of um ways of being and frameworks of culture, like the old stuff just never quite disappears. You know, the past isn't gone, it's not even past. So, so like the 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 structures that slash used will continue to pop up in new things that's being written. Um, we find it useful to think of slash as being over because it allows us to understand it as something that is tied to particular times and places and moments, right? Um both in media, I think like the it's not not at all coincidental that our kind of bell curve of slash also fits with a particular online situation um, where the internet is becoming more widely used, but it has not become universal. Um, and then when you get the dominance of social media, you actually lose that specificity because everything's all in there together. And that's both good and bad, right? Um, but I mean, so slash is definitely like developed a framework, even a, like you call it a pedagogy for like having your desires and having your fantasies and like really embracing them as they are. Like the, the discussion of the id and there's a famous um, slash meta text about the so-called id vortex from the early 2000s where it's like, we know how to look into the abyss and we write stories about it. Um, and embracing that this this is my desire, even if it's problematic, I'm going to write about it, I'm going to discuss it, I'm going to explore it. It's not going to be so-called politically correct, but I'm going to really think about what it means. Um, and that does break down a little bit when you start to really think about the implication of politics and desire, because our desire may be our desire, but that doesn't make it innocent. You know, it has consequences. And fan of color critique is one of many of the people who are saying, well, what about the consequences? What do you do with it? And so in the book, we talk about kind of slash that's kind of being written later, that's in bigger sets of conversations as, as being work that actually does try to do some of that education of desire, right? So you'll have writers who are consciously saying, okay, like this fandom is really dominated by these two particular white dudes. Um, I'm going to make sure when I do my writing, even if I do write about this pairing, that I'm really thoughtful and careful about the kind of world that I create um, in relationship to the characters of color. But you also see um, like Marvel Comics Universe fic that's written from an abolitionist perspective, right? Where it's like, hey, you know what? Superheroes are kind of fascist. What if they weren't, <laughs> right? What if they all realized that superheroes are kind of fascist and try to make it things work differently? Um, you know, so I see like a radical politics as being one of the fantasies that starts to be operationalized in fact in fic. I mean, in, in all honesty, that's my favorite fic. Like, so I love writing about that stuff, even as um, I think the founding fantasies of Slush are more problematic than that, but they don't quite go away. Um, so I think, you know, as Slash becomes more cognizant of the consequences of that desire. Um, it stops being slash in quite the same ways and something different maybe emerges. Uh, but you don't, the specificities of slash don't disappear. Um, I think I'm about to be delivered a, a baby to join in this conversation, if you all don't mind. Sorry, I'm technically on parental leave right now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my wife has a work meeting. <laughs> but I'm still available. This is not his first video. I may then have a much more basic question, uh, taking several steps back in terms of your examination of uh, fan, fan fiction and slash. And the examples that I'm familiar with and the ones that you quoted are often to do with fantasy and science fiction genres. Um, and I'm just wondering whether certain types of 
original materials, you know, render themselves um, as better fodder for for slash or for shipping. I mean, yes, you you showed Sherlock also, right? So some crime fiction, but um, because I don't know the field well enough to have an opinion on that, I was wondering if if in some way there is any thinking of which particular genres. Um, I don't know, are more popular as inspiration. So part of the answer to that question is, an, is, is about communities and the ways that communities form. Um, slash as we know it, um, is it comes out of science fiction fan communities, right? There was an infrastructure around Star Trek in particular, people were writing stories and sharing and sharing um, their ideas through zines already. And science fiction fandom built a lot of infrastructure that other communities used online. So that is part of why, like it was the science fiction people who were writing fan fiction. And so fan fiction and, and science fiction really came together. Um, however, that was never the only context. And so like Sherlock fandom is uh, like Sherlock Holmes had, had a big infrastructure too that also feeds in. Um, and then there are also different contexts. So like music fans writing fan fiction about um, musicians um, or then anime and manga, which has its own, own um, long and venerable traditions of um, non-professional writing. You know, all of these strands come into each other. Um, so I think at this point, is um, in our current moment of post slash, right? Fan fiction is a bit, you can write fan fiction for just about anything. You can find fan fiction for just about anything. Um, and there's a lot of real person slash, right? And so for example, um, BTS, huge fandom for writing pairings about um, the Korean pop music, you know? So there are particular fandoms that gain particular strength. Um, one of the reasons that we're, we like to try and be particular specific and say slash is a thing and there are lots of other things that do similar work that come in together is because we think there are specific things about for example star trek that had big influences in shaping this genre of fan fiction um and so one of the things about science fiction fandom is just that it's got this infrastructural place it also has a lot of crossover between professional and amateur writers so i wouldn't think one thing that i would argue not particularly in this book but just in everyday life is that fandom and fan fiction's community structures have had an enormous influence on speculative fiction professional publishing um on work that's coming out now on like you know, like N.K. Jemison, for example, has been very open about um, having been a fan fiction writer. Like she was one of the fan of color critics who was posting online at the time that I was, was writing about in the, early, in the mid 2000s. Right. You know, things like that. Um, so I think science fiction and fantasy just have a lot of crossover with with fan fiction fandom. But you know, that's also because I'm a science fiction fantasy scholar, right? So that's where I see it. You know, if I were an anime manga scholar, I would be seeing it there. It comes in lots of different places. And I want to be specific about where I'm coming from, where I'm seeing it, because I think that enables other specificities to also be, be brought forth. Um, <clears throat> thank you. We have a, a longer question in the chat. This is a question from Bartłomiej Gonsiorek. Uh, so my questions are bounded with a worry, as I was actually kind of disturbed when I noticed in one of the slides picture presenting Sam and Dean Winchester, protagonists of uh, Supernatural, Quinn, Plot and Story are siblings, a pair of brothers hunting unnatural monsters and beings. As I understand the topic of meeting suggests existence of such texts, uh, presenting the relation in a sexual way. Here comes my question. Are there in this innovative branch of literature that is Fan fiction we discussed today, certain taboos and topics which are often avoided or even discouraged. How should we act when encountering such works? Should we make efforts for them to be deleted or maybe contrary? Everything while taking into account um, quite the creative control which often the singular author have over their works. So I think um, I would say that fan fiction often specializes in the disturbing. Um, and that fan fiction communities have extremely intense debates over what is and isn't appropriate and how disturbing something should be, right? Um, in our current moment, there is a bit of a move towards um, being more concerned with the consequences of a problematic, dangerous, damaging representation than with the freedom to express it. Um, in peak slash, I would say, 
there was a lot of embrace of the disturbing. And so, yes, um, Sam and Dean Winchester, the protagonists of Supernatural, are a primary pairing of that fandom, and they are siblings. There is a lot of incest. Um, and people in fandom were theorizing, like, why am I attracted to this? Why am I drawn to this? This is really weird and messed up. Why am I drawn to it? You know, there's also lots and lots of fic that breaks other taboos, um, non-con, but fix about sexual violence. There's fic about um, underage sex. There's fic about everything you can imagine and also lots of people saying that it shouldn't exist. Um, and so I think because it is this no gatekeeper space, right, where you can put anything online, um, and sometimes there's been tension between fic writers and the platforms that are supporting them. That was how our that's how archive of our own initially came to be because um, people were for, for, connected to two events that happened. One of which was people being pushed off of the pre-social media site Live Journal because their work was being considered obscene. The other was um, some folks trying to capitalize on on fan fiction. Right. Um, interestingly enough, like both of these have continued to be tensions that have come up in other platforms. Um, but the idea of um, freedom of expression, sexual fantasy freedom of expression, has been very central to the emergent development of fan communities. Um, and there has been bo pushback both from within fan communities and from outside, from platforms, and even in some cases, um, legally. Yeah, and I think we can kind of add to this 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 debate. Uh, you know, the questions of pornography, right? Because you know, I mean, slash often has you know quite um, quite erotic or simply kind of you know porny elements. And you know, then another kind of part of this debate is is slash is can slash fiction be considered another form of pornography? Pornography for women or by women and queer folks? So it's a uh, and um, the topics and the taboos that are kind of broken in, in pornography or you know they they run the whole gamut i mean whatever you can imagine you know there is there is a porn movie or porn clip about it and uh, it's it's kind of i think um there's something to it when it comes to to the slash fiction and fan fiction in general but you know whatever you imagine you can probably find it um i think there are like i think last time i checked <laughs> which was last week i think it was 10 million works in archive on, on on archive our own right so you know we're talking about 10 million um fanfics so this is this this is a huge number of uh, of works written and, and a lot of them are you know hundreds of thousands uh, hundreds of thousands of um words long so this is this is you know whole books written about you know specific fandoms okay i think we can uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask just like like one last question and uh, um, and I think we'll call it a day. Um, so just gonna maybe last quick question. Uh, if I can come back to, um, to to what we mentioned at the very end. So I was thinking about pornography and then the kind of you know pornography debates um, because you know some of this um, some of the discussions connected with uh, with slash, slash fiction with fan fiction in general kind of you know do dive into in, into porn uh, wars or kind of you know sex wars and um you know different kind of feminist formulations of that and i was kind of wondering if um if this is a perspective that you and and christina busa are exploring in your in your book so kind of thinking about how different a slash is from pornography how similar it is or or are perhaps or is perhaps the, the kind of pornography framework completely wrong or kind of inaccurate for discussing slash fiction or perhaps it is actually useful for in your research so just on this kind of meta perspective like how useful this 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 uh, approach is for you um and uh, in your book yeah i'm sorry <laughs> um we are so we're not necessarily taking up porn because porn studies is a whole field and so we are trying to learn from porn studies but I don't know that we would say that our book is part of porn studies um I think because porn studies often not always but very often is focused on kind of professional porn right porn as an economy um and what makes fan fiction um particularly notable in our argument, and of course, it is professionalizing too, like that lots and lots of people are publishing their fan fiction. Um, but we, I think we really use Joanna Russ's 1984 essay, Pornography by Women for Women with Love. We find that framework, um, we don't think it's really been bettered necessarily, right? That 
um, she uh, she says, well, there's this division between pornography and um, erotica, and it implies, you know, porn is bad, erotica is good, all the rest of it. Um, that, that division is not really that interesting, but let's talk about sexual fantasy. You know, and porn is a form of sexual fantasy that's often reflected through capitalism. People are selling fantasy and producing fantasy for sale. Um, but sexual fantasy, um, I think, although how raw it is, now that there's a massive infrastructure around it, it's very public and all the rest of it is questionable. But I think for us, taking up fantasy, sexual and non-sexual, and its politics, um, is a way of thinking about many of the same things that Porn Studies thinks about, but that it's important for us to think about sex not as separate from other forms of being, which porn is porn is like here is your sex on a plate, you know, like and and fan fiction is like here's your fantasy. And it might be sexual, but actually um, it might, you know, what you might really want to read about, what you might really need to read about is people like just sitting in a room together, drinking tea for 16,000 words. You know, like a lot of fan fiction. I mean, there's lots of sex and fan fiction and there's lots of stuff that's not about sex. And we're interested in both of those things. So porn is in some ways only a small part of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you you mentioned this during your lecture when you talk about you know what what you get in the in the in slash is more than just sex. You get quite a lot of um, you know discussions about power relationships, power dynamics, and you know comforting and um, kind of you know her, I don't know kind of being involved in, in in all kinds of relationships. So so there's definitely I do understand this, and I'm thank you for clarifying. Okay, I think uh, we should call it a night um, because it's been, um, yeah, I, I think we are slowly kind of reaching our time limit. So thank you so much for participating. Um, thank you for showing us um, your uh, your take on Slash and um, and kind of, you know, racialized desires in it. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Alexis, so much. Thank you all very much. And if anybody has questions for me, uh, feel free to contact me. You can find me easily online. Thank you and bye.